What a surprise. SpaceX revealed the real reason why Starship's heat shield turned orange during re-entry. It turns out, this wasn't a technical failure at all, but the result of a special experimental metal plate the company had installed, which unexpectedly triggered a chemical reaction. So, how did this happen, and what does it mean for the future of Starship's metallic heat shield? Let's find out in today's episode of Alpha Tech. Many might not realize this, but Flight 10 was one of those rare occasions where we got to witness Starship touching down gently on the ocean, a truly thrilling and exciting moment. Clearly, this is also a major achievement, proving that ship version 2 is far from being a flawed design. For many, it may have looked like just another landing, but from an engineer's perspective, pulling it off requires an extraordinary level of fine-tuning and precision. From mission control, precise commands are sent to the ship via Starship's RF system, with extremely low latency, just a few hundred milliseconds. Inside, the guidance software integrates data from GPS, INMU, and altimeters through the internal data bus, then reignites the Raptor engines at the exact moment needed. The thrust has to be adjusted in real time, synchronized with the COPV system to maintain proper fuel flow pressure. All of this happens autonomously within seconds, making that smooth splashdown we see on video the result of an incredibly complex, finely tuned system. And that's something most people don't really notice. In fact, 99% of viewers were more focused on that strange orange patch on Starship's heat shield just before splashdown. Scroll through any forum or social media page, and you'll see endless debates about this orange mystery. To clear up any guesswork, Elon Musk explained it himself. The orange color is rust from rapid oxidation of metallic test tiles. That makes it pretty clear. Before the flight, they had installed a metallic heat shield tile on the ship's body, alongside the traditional ceramic thermal protection system. These tiles were added to evaluate their performance compared to regular ceramic tiles, and also to see if it could meet the demands of rapid reuse. They were placed right where the orange oxidation streaks started to flow. But why does that metal tile create such a big orange streak? Let me explain. From a physics perspective, metals, especially steel or iron alloys, tend to oxidize when exposed to the open air without any protection. However, in space, particularly in the vacuum of deep space, there are almost no oxygen molecules or water vapor for the metal to react with. The situation changes dramatically during re-entry to Earth. Around 110 kilometers altitude, UV radiation from the sun breaks apart oxygen molecules, producing highly reactive atomic oxygen. As Elon said, metal oxidizes fast at Mach 25. This causes the metal tiles that SpaceX installed on Starship to oxidize thousands of times faster when exposed to the high temperatures and plasma during re-entry. You could see the plasma around Ship 37 turning pink at about 94 kilometers altitude, and it kept intensifying, making the vehicle glow with ionized gas. That extreme heat alone would erode the metal surface, releasing tiny iron particles. But what really spread those particles was the activation of the active cooling system. As the cooling liquid escaped through microscopic holes, it carried the oxidized iron outward, leaving behind a thin layer of rust-colored residue. Without those experimental tiles and their liquid cooling, the heat shield would have stayed much cleaner and mostly black. But with them, the surface ended up coated in this orange iron oxide powder. These particles then settle on the surrounding ceramic tiles. And when the ship encounters humid air or seawater after splashdown, they spread and react further, forming the orange rust streaks. The location of the streaks usually matches where the metallic test tiles were installed starting from the lower nose cone and extending downward. Honestly, seeing Starship glowing orange like that instantly reminded me of NASA's SLS vehicle. But the sad truth is, SLS can only launch and then get thrown away mid-flight. It will never pull off a smooth landing like Starship and Super Heavy. Yes, that means Starship's ceramic heat shield system is still working well. It can be studied and improved for even greater durability in the future. But did you notice? Around the nose cone area, it also turned white, didn't it? As Musk said, worth noting that the heat shield tiles almost entirely stayed attached, so the latest upgrades are looking good. The red color is from some metallic test tiles that oxidized, and the white is from insulation of areas where we deliberately remove tiles. 
The truth is, SpaceX intentionally removed a few ceramic heat shield tiles in those areas to expose the insulation underneath. This insulation, usually made of composites or heat-resistant fibers, can handle extreme re-entry temperatures. And because these materials are typically white, they help reflect heat and reduce thermal transfer to Starship's stainless steel skin. During re-entry, Ship 37 faced the extreme temperatures we just discussed. In areas without the ceramic tiles, the white insulation had to endure direct heat, causing it to melt slightly and spread around the nose cone as it interacted with the atmosphere. Unlike the metallic test tiles, which oxidized rapidly due to atomic oxygen at around 110 km altitude and created orange iron oxide streaks, the insulation contains no easily oxidized metals. That's why it stays white instead of turning orange. So, after this test, is Elon Musk still planning to use metallic heat shield tiles? Well, SpaceX hasn't released the full results yet. Beyond the obvious signs of oxidation, we still don't know if there are deeper structural issues, like warping or even melting under extreme temperatures. But what we do know is this. Even the oxidation itself already gives us some important insights. First, metallic tiles will inevitably oxidize after each flight. With just three test tiles, we saw a huge portion of Starship stained orange. Imagine what thousands of them would look like. If left untreated, this could slowly degrade the surface. Of course, the erosion itself may not be severe, but SpaceX would need to wash off the oxidation layer after every flight. While that's not too labor-intensive, it doesn't exactly fit the vision of rapid 24-hour turnaround. Second, metallic tiles are designed for multiple reuses without needing massive replacements like ceramic. Flight 10 already proved this. Starship survived with deliberately removed tiles, plus the metallic test tiles, showing that the system can withstand worst-case scenarios and still be reused. If optimized, metallic tiles could help Starship truly become fully and rapidly reusable, far beyond the Space Shuttle, which required months of inspection after each mission. Third, SpaceX doesn't see oxidation as a deal-breaker, they treat it as valuable data for optimization. In the future, they might test super alloys like Inconel 718 or Hastaloy X, which naturally form protective oxide layers. These materials can withstand 1,200 to 1,500 degrees Celsius, while their oxidation rates are dozens of times lower than standard stainless steel. In short, even if SpaceX has to clean off oxidation after every flight, Starship's reusability goal remains achievable. And if ceramic tiles continue to perform reliably without catastrophic failures, their lighter weight might still give them the edge. So, here's the big question. Can metallic heat shields truly replace ceramic tiles in the future? Share your thoughts in the comments below. When Musk first proposed the idea of a metallic heat shield, he admitted that integrating a regenerative cooling system would be a major challenge in making it work for Starship. The concept is to use tiny holes and pump liquid water, or even propellant, through them to actively cool the surface. But here's the catch. This has never been seriously proposed or tested before. While the general idea has been around for 50 to even 100 years, there has never been any significant research into metallic heat shields that rely on transpiration or film cooling. In fact, metal-based thermal protection systems are already rare and they remain largely untested in modern aerospace. Still, there is a potential solution, and that's the approach SpaceX applied in Flight 10. Back in the 2000s, Germany's aerospace agency, DLR, experimented with a material called Proxelit 170, a porous thermal protection material made of 91% aluminum oxide and 9% silicon oxide. In wind tunnel tests, they were able to cool P-170 from a blistering 1,750 degrees Celsius, or 3,200 degrees Fahrenheit, down to just 25 degrees Celsius using water. The cooling rate was about 0.065 kilograms of water per second for every square meter, under a heat flux of 200 kilowatts per square meter. For Starship stainless steel design, though, things look very different. Stainless steel can tolerate much higher temperatures and radiates heat more effectively. On top of that, Starship's metallic shield would be much thinner than P-170 and wouldn't need to be cooled all the way down to room temperature during re-entry. So, while DLR's results offer a useful starting point, they can't be applied directly to Starship. 
To truly understand how a stainless steel, water-cooled heat shield might perform, dedicated experiments will be needed. Still, the DLR numbers give us at least a baseline, a rough, worst-case scenario, for estimating how much coolant Starship might require. If we assume Starship's water-cooled heat shield were to cover an area equal to half a cylinder, roughly 800 square meters or 8,600 square feet, then actively cooling the entire surface under extreme conditions would demand about 52 kilograms of water per second. Of course, this is a massive oversimplification. In reality, heat during atmospheric re-entry doesn't spread evenly across a spacecraft's surface. Aerodynamics create complex airflow patterns that concentrate thermal loads in certain regions, like the leading edges and control surfaces. These hot spots require specialized thermal protection systems, TPS, capable of withstanding far more intense conditions. For example, NASA's space shuttle relied on fragile reinforced carbon-carbon tiles on its leading edges. DLR, on the other hand, explored water cooling as a safer and potentially more reliable alternative in its theoretical space liner concept. Starship's design could take a similar approach, using targeted active cooling on critical sections, while applying less resource-intensive methods to the rest of the surface. That strategy alone would dramatically reduce the total water required during re-entry. Beyond just heat flux, the real unknown is when and for how long such a system would need to supply coolant. In a worst-case scenario, Starship might need to continuously pump 50-plus kilograms per second of water throughout the entire high-drag, high-heating re-entry phase, which could last over five minutes, 600-plus seconds. If the spacecraft also needs to rely heavily on aerodynamic braking to conserve propellant for interplanetary missions, it might require multiple cooling cycles per re-entry. That could add up to at least 15 metric tons of water per re-entry. The problem is obvious. While SpaceX envisions Starship delivering 100-plus tons of payload to the Martian surface, carrying 15 tons of coolant would eat heavily into that capacity. For deep space or interplanetary operations, that trade-off could make water-cooled shields impractical, at least in their most demanding form. Elon Musk once explained it simply. Basically, you just need a stainless steel sandwich. You run fuel or water between the layers of the sandwich, then you have tiny perforations on the windward side and essentially pump coolant through them to keep the rocket's leading surface cool.